The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's from the Society of St. Pius V, and he's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Tom. Good evening to you. You too. Thank you, Good Father. Good to see you. Father, I'd like to try and get through some emails tonight, if we could. <laughs> so we have uh, an email here from a viewer who comments on a recent remark that you made in one of our programs concerning uh, immodestly dressed women in the pro-life movement. And this viewer says that he has himself encountered that particular problem. He says, I was amazed at how you hit the nail on the head when you commented on the immodest dress of women. Uh, he says your comment was particular to the women at pro-life rallies, but really it's, it's fitting in all walks of life. So he says, there's so many women who say that they profess the Catholic faith and yet though they will dress immodestly. Um, he, he goes on to say that he has tried to approach women and explain this to them, and he's had a very negative response from them. So his question is, Father, how can one approach women who are dressed immodestly, especially in this pro-life movement, but really in all walks of life, how can one approach them in a modestly dressed woman and explain the problem to her? With a great deal of fear and trepidation. Okay. okay. Very, very cautiously. Okay. Uh, women are extremely sensitive to this, right? And uh, the ironic thing, Tom, is that you may have women who are protesting abortion and speaking up for the pro-life cause very vehemently and vociferously and rightly, okay? Even courageously. And they'll be on one side of the fence, and then the Planned Parenthood people will be on the other side of the fence, screaming their support for abortion, and yet the women on both sides of the fence are dressed the same way, right? Uh, and uh, you have to ask yourself, if the, the women on, shall we say, our side of the fence, the pro-life fence, just simply don't get it, and if this doesn't um, undermine the whole point, their whole message, uh, of, in fact, to confront a pro-life woman about her immodest dress will sometimes draw the same uh, vehement negative reaction as confronting a woman going in for an abortion about the humanity of her child. And you get the same almost fury that you would dare challenge them. And uh, this is a very big problem with the so-called pro-life effort, especially on part of the woman's part. Um, now, if you, if you connect the dots, okay, you say, okay, well, now here, here's the scenario. You have a woman who's conceived a child, and she wants to go in and have the child put to death. She wants to destroy the child right? and the child's life and thus save herself whatever trouble the child would be to her, right? And um, you, you, you ask the question, well, where does the child come from? Well, the child is the result of, of human conception, right? Mm -hmm. And human conception is the result of uh, human interaction, right? And which involves the attraction between the man and the woman, right? The physical attraction. The physical attraction has to do with the the way a man thinks of a woman, right? And how he's attracted to her. And uh, this involves, uh, well, if there's true love, it, it involves also, even if it's true love, involves a physical attraction, which God has put there, right? But without true love, okay, if it's just an animal attraction devoid of anything of soul and mind and you know, intellect and will and so on, just the pure animal attraction. You can see that immodesty has a great deal to do with this. A woman 
attracting a man on a purely physical level. So for a woman to disassociate that immodesty, that accentuation of her body basically as merely a material thing, right? Accentuating the, uh, the physical aspect of her body to, to uh, awaken in a man a physical attraction to her. Uh, you know, she would have to, any, any sensible woman would, would make that connection, would realize, well, yeah, there must be a connection between attracting a man in this way by immodesty and the ultimate result of a woman conceiving a child and then going in to have the child terminated, to have the child killed, right? Why, why is it that our pro-life women don't seem to be willing to admit that? Um, the way they present themselves physically, even on that sidewalk carrying their signs, actually has something to do with the fact with this woman now walking past them through the gates of Planned Parenthood to have the child put to death. Why can't they see the connection there? Is it that they simply don't want to or don't want to see it? And when you point it out to them, they're infuriated that someone actually said it uh, when they're trying so much to ignore it. You know? I don't know if I'm making myself clear enough on this, okay? But uh, basically, any clothing that uh, accentuates the, the, sexual, uh, the, the sexual attributes of the body, okay? I'm trying to be very delicate, very delicate about this, okay? <laughs> that... Um, you know, clothing is made not to reveal, but to conceal, right? And any clothing that accentuates the sexual aspects, and in this space, particularly of the female body, by uncovering it, or by, by accentuating it, even by being, by covering it in such a way that, that, that it is contoured to the body because it is so tight, right? Or uh, that draws attention to the... Uh, the sexual acts, and for a man, you know, that's not hard to do, you know. Uh, um, shorts and uh, tight blouses and all the rest um, naturally do that for a man. Bring attention where the attention should not be. That's one reason why pants are so bad on women, because they actually bring attention to where attention shouldn't be. I mean, they have vectors pointing where the attention should not be. And skirts are so much more modest than that. When they're long enough and when they're loose enough, um, they they do create uh, a, a certain feminine mystique there, which is more of an intellectual, uh, even perhaps even more of a spiritual thing. But um, but pants, uh, they're just grossly they just they just point to parts of the woman's body that where a man's attention should not be drawn. And uh, this is true when a woman is standing still. It's especially true when she's moving in these things. And um, so, and until our young, uh, until our women, I'm not talking just about young women. I'm talking about a middle-aged woman, even older women, okay, above middle age, until they they are willing to admit the fact that their dress is part of the problem, that their fashions are part of the problem. Um, they are really not going to be effective pro-life voices. Sure. Uh, no matter how loudly they proclaim the pro-life message, they're actually wearing the uniform of the enemy, of, of the pro-death abortionists, by dressing immodestly. Sure. Um, I mean, and I want to get too far afield here. What is the first thing that happens in socialist and communist countries? When socialism takes over, when communism takes over, the first thing they do is they go for the unisex look. Why do they put the women in pants? Why in the Soviet Union? Did they, and, and, in, and in communist China? Why early on in Mao's control, right? Or in Lenin's control? Why did they have the women dressed just like the men? Almost indistinguishably, the men and the women. They wanted to break down the male, not only the male and the female, they wanted to break down the masculine and the feminine. That's on a spiritual, intellectual level. And the reason why they wanted to do this is because they, they wanted to break down the idea uh, uh, of the family. Okay, They wanted to break down a, a something essential in the component 
of the affection between the, the, the husband and the wife, their roles, their care for each other. And you find this in all totalitarian societies because the only loyalty in a totalitarian society must be to the party. That must come first, right? Everything else must be sacrificed. You find this in the Soviet Union from its very inception. You find this in communist China from the takeover of Mao and his and his uh, communist cohorts. They, they set about destroying that loyalty in the family. And one of the means they did this was by fashions, by the unisex look that you're, look, first and foremost, you are not even male and female. First and foremost, you are a uh, subject of the Communist Party and you're a good communist. That's where your loyalty is. Um, we're playing right into their hands when we dress the way that these uh, uh, that, that these godless dictators want us to. So the women have to, they have to face that fact. Uh, well, why do they do it? Well, convenience. That's what they say. They always come back to that. Convenience, it's just, uh, and, and comfort, right? This is more important to them than anything else. Well, it's the same idea that has basically been the, the, the acid that has broken down any obligations in our society. And uh, also they look upon it as an attack on them as though you are um, sort of breaking down that equality, you know, equality between men and women. Women want equal rights now. And when you ask why, well, then, then the women argue that the men themselves are often so irresponsible and women are left holding the bag and holding the responsibility that women want equal rights with men, which for them means that they want to be able to be equally irresponsible. So, I mean, going from that argument that men often are irresponsible and they do not take care of their families, which unfortunately is, all, is very true. Right. Um, but at least the children in the family had their mother. Uh, now they want to take that away too, because they want the mother to be able to be equally irresponsible. Obviously, the solution to the irresponsibility of men for their families is not to make women equally irresponsible, but to make men responsible. This is the only real solution, to demand that men be responsible, to live up to their responsibilities. If your answer is equality, uh, uh, then the, and, and demand, allow women to be equally irresponsible with men, uh, then you've just destroyed the whole society. And the children become wards of the state, or not even that. They just become feral children trying to raise themselves in gangs. All too often that's the case here in our, our own country right now. Modesty, the question of how women and men dress in society is a big part of this. And um, it, it, it is difficult to, uh, to get this across to women because uh, they've been raised with this from the mm -hmm. tenderest years. Yeah. Earliest years, they just accept it as a given. And if you dare challenge it, they become ferocious with you. How do you therefore approach it? Well, you, you have to kind of approach it indirectly to go up to a woman and say, you're immodestly dressed, you're a scandal. Um, you do not represent the pro-life cause well. In fact, uh, you know, you better represent the pro-abortion side by the way you're dressed. Well, that's really not going to help matters right off the bat. But generally speaking, if a woman is there because she really is pro-life, you need to uh, kind of approach it from that angle about pro-life, what it means to be pro-life, and try to work work the thinking there let, to enable her to draw the conclusions. Um, if you start, and I, I realize it, it isn't always going to work because there, there are women who are not always going to cooperate with this, but it seems to me that the best hope of success is appealing to their right thinking and working your way to the right conclusions. So, you know, what I suggest they try is they talk to a woman and, and, and point out about the immorality, the sexual promiscuity that leads to regarding a child as a result of, uh, you know, man and women uh, together, that the child is the unwanted byproduct 
and that this is this is not the purpose mm -hmm. of them being together. So okay. to the point where uh, that the child is the intruder and needs to be killed. You know, if you talk to most pro-life women, I think they would agree that this is the tragedy. That people do not see the 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 bringing of human life into the world as their their primary purpose. They say this as a, they see the the conception of a child's life as the enemy and as the um, actual obstacle to their real purpose, which is their own personal selfish pressure, pleasure. And uh, if a pro-life woman agrees with that idea and laments that with you, I mean, you can actually begin to a conversation and talk about how how the, the young people dress these days and how they're, they're out to, to snare men in, you know with this provocative uh, look and provocative behavior, and that they've breaking down, broken down the feminine in the women. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, this is necessarily, as the argument would present, progress word for word or step by step, but I'm just saying that this is the direction it should go. And then to point out the, the dress even of the pro-abortionists on the other side of the fence and talk about, you know, look at how these ladies are dressing over here. You know, I mean, you know, 50% of their flesh is exposed, their skin is exposed. They're wearing these these tight shirts and all the rest. And they kind of actually wearing the uniform of the pro-abortion crowd, you know. And often they are dressed this way. Mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood sure. uh, actually has their own livery, as it were. And, you know, you hope it would kind of dawn on the woman that, hey, you know, I'm really not dressed much differently than she is, you know. So you kind of have to be very implicit. And then the nice thing about this is women uh, think in terms of implicit. You know, men, men usually don't. <laughs> uh, men usually just say what's on their mind. And this gets them into trouble uh, often, you know. <laughs> Um, but women are always looking for, like, what is the deeper meaning? What are they really trying to say? You That's know? true. So you get two women talking to each other, and they're speaking implicitly, and there's a man in the room, and he doesn't, he doesn't follow the logic, but the women do, because they catch the implications, you know? So if a man is trying to be very subtle, and he's trying to imply certain things, okay, uh, he, can, he can be pretty confident that a woman is going to pick up on on implications when they're even not there. But if, he, if he's trying to get a message across, then being implicit about this sometimes give you, gives you a better hope of success. Sure. That a woman makes that final connection between the way the pro-abortionist is dressing and the way I'm dressing here in my spandex or whatever, on this side of the fence, and I'm trying to talk the woman in spandex out of going in and having your child killed. And there really is a connection between these two things. But all that, when all that's said is to end up, okay, the most important single thing that our writer can do is pray 12 memorares to our Blessed Mother before he even begins, before he even takes a breath to say the first word. He needs to pray for guidance and help. But he needs to pray not only for his own enlightenment as to how to approach this, he needs to pray that the woman he's talking to will have the grace of God to enable her to receive what he's saying gracefully. So he needs to pray for himself, but he also needs to pray 10 times as much for her. Okay, because he, he will present the external grace by what he says but she's going to need the internal graces in order to enable her to accept what he's saying. So the value of prayer is inestimable whenever you're addressing something like this. Sure. You know, Father, in regards to the pro-life movement, I've heard that abortion is the ultimate impurity. And so I think it's so important to, to draw that uh, mm -hmm. connection there between impure clothing. It's just a step in, mm -hmm. the, in the line to get to the ultimate impurity, which is abortion. Mm -hmm. But in regards to the uh, to practical advice, you know, you, you mentioned the differences between men and women, and I actually had a priest tell me once in, in a situation like that where there's an immodestly dressed woman that, that needs to be approached, that 
if a man sees this and a man wants to do something about it, a great course of action that he can take is, if this option is available, to approach another woman who is perhaps more modestly dressed and ask if that woman can approach the woman. So that way it's woman to woman. So if that option is available, that's that's can be a much better course. Well, that's, that's a very good point. And uh, actually, I, I would encourage the women who understand the modesty question to talk to the others. Okay, and uh, they should invoke our Blessed Mother at her example, of course. Um, I mean, 99% of the people out there are going to be Novus Ordo Catholics of the more conservative bent, bent or traditional Catholics outright, right? So um, most of the people involved will have a certain devotion to our Blessed Lady. So, but yes, a woman, a woman can make that. And perhaps especially, a, I don't know, maybe a younger woman, too. You know, an older woman talking to a younger woman. Sometimes the younger women think, well, you know, to be modest, I have to look frumpy. But you know a number of older women who look very elegant. Right? And if said they can set the example of elegance and modesty at the same time, that's very important. Looking frumpy is not a Christian or Catholic virtue. But looking elegant is something of, of uh, genuine art, you know, the true, the good, and the beautiful. And God wants that enhanced by elegance. But uh, young, young ladies especially need to get on that, uh, on that uh, I won't call it a bandwagon. They need to get on that train of thought, though, of modesty. That they, especially our pro-life leaders among the young, and we have many of our own graduates who are leading the pro-life efforts in local colleges now. I'm very proud of them for that. And I want them to also lead the charge for modesty and, and show the connection, not only by the way they talk, but by the way they dress. You know, the, the, the virtue of modesty for a Catholic is the virtue of not drawing attention to oneself, not making a spectacle of oneself. And the matter of dress is just one aspect of that. Sure. But it is a very big one. So... Um, if, if if one is going to be in a position to draw attention to herself, she wants that attention to be pure. She wants that attention to be wholesome. She wants that attention to be edifying. She wants it not to point to her, but to God, right? And uh, she should dress accordingly. That I so wish our young people would, would address that issue of modesty among their pro-life crowd and not be afraid to bring that up. So what you're saying, Tom, about enlisting the ladies in the, involved, that is essential. And real, real quick, Father, one last thing. You know, you mentioned the uh, totalitarian states where they'll have kind of the, the unisex look. I don't know if you saw this, but just within the last day or two, there was an article on LifeSite with a link to uh, the singer, C um, C uh, what's her name? C I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she Celine has Dion. Celine Dion. That's it. There you go. She had uh, some... Uh, Thank you, Jorge. Some... Uh, <laughs> Some announcement, there's some little little video commercial type thing that she put out. Oh, a line of clothing. A line of Children's clothing, I believe. Children's. Yeah, where she goes into this. It's like Halloween costumes, and it's all a cult. She goes into this hospital, though, in the, the nursery cool. area where there's all the, the blue and the pink for, for the boy and the girl, and she uh, somehow changes them all. It's just some kind of dull gray mm -hmm. thing, so everyone looks the same. There's no mm -hmm. color, anything in there. And I, I believe there's something even in the, the advertisement about, you know, these are not our children, we need to get rid of these stereotypes, stop forcing mm -hmm. these stereotypes on her. So you definitely see that. I, I think today. that uh, was first on the Vigilant Citizen, the Vigilant Citizen website. They've been doing this for years, bringing out the occultic message in these pop culture you know, people. And, uh, you know, Madonna and Lady, Lady Gaga, uh, Gag or whatever. Lady they're, Gag. <laughs> they're, they're trying to bring out the fact that they've got the occult message, the all-seeing eye, you know, and all that in their in their uh, music and their videos and so on, and yeah, that that's that clothing line that brought out by this Beyonce poor, poor lady is a prime example of instilling the, uh, the 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 occult in the children's lives from the earliest years, even from the cradle. Definitely. All right, well, Father, let's move on uh, to another email here. This one is a question about marriage. So this viewer writes in from India, actually. 
And he says, in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, what exactly is the purpose of marriage? I'm asking you because I have heard Father Nicholas Gruner and Father Malachi Martin say that the primary aim is to procure children, and then secondarily, the support of old age. But the online version of the Catechism of the Council of Trent states that a second reason for marriage is the desire of family. So which one is it, Father? The principal aim of marriage and the secondary aim. What is the difference? There? Well, the very first command that God gave to any human being was to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when he said to them, increase, multiply, and fill the earth. In other words, God gave the command to give life. Okay? He joined them together with that mission of giving life. He married them. Right? That's the first great command. God also uh, created them, male and female, so that they would be of mutual assistance to each other. So there were these two purposes for which God made male and female. <laughs> now, the first is to give life. The second is the mutual assistance that render each other. Now, our, our writer uh, of this question, he says from India. Yes, ma'am. Oh, interesting. Okay. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be seen in India. I guess. <laughs> yes, so, definitely. Hello to all the you know, Catholics in India. Um, this uh, gentleman, I believe the gentleman, is referring to the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which uh, talks about the, the sacrament of matrimony. And it, it starts talking about what we might call the incentives or the motives for marriage, the joining of man and woman. Um, and in the enlisting the motives, the first motive is, that is given is the natural attraction between man and woman and the comfort that they can bring to each other. That's the first motive that is given. The second motive or reason that is given is the sake of family and uh, bringing children into the world and raising one's own family. Okay. Now that can be a little confusing um, in light of the fact that it might appear to contradict the order of Genesis, in which God says, increase, multiply, fill the earth, give me life, give, give children, and uh, secondly, uh, care for each other. You know? It seems that in giving the motives, the Catechism of the Council of Trent might uh, reverse the order. But that's not so. Because if you keep reading in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it soon then mentions what are called the bona matrimoni, the goods of marriage or the goods of matrimony. There you have the statement of God's purposes. And you realize, well, earlier when it was talking about the motives for marriage, they're talking about the human motives. The motives why a man and a woman would unite in matrimony. So in those terms, yes, the human motive, the first human motive might be the man is attracted to the woman, the woman is attracted to the man, and they enhance each other's lives. And then secondarily, they think in terms of the family that will come from that. Okay, This is looking at it from the human point of view. When you get to the goods of matrimony, though, slightly later in the catechism, now it's clear the very primary essential purpose of God in instituting marriage as a natural union, and then later, with our Lord Jesus Christ's coming, elevating that natural union of marriage to the supernatural union of matrimony, a sacrament. The primary essential purpose is the purpose of giving life. The Catechism of the Council of Trent makes it absolutely clear. The primary essential purpose from God, from God's motivation, you might say, to us to make male and female and join them together was precisely to give life. And the secondary essential purpose is the mutual comfort and support of the spouses for each other. There's a third purpose for the sacrament, and that is the bonum sacramenti, which is the good of the sacrament, the supernatural life of the, of the husband and wife. In other words, now they're not only helping each other to live happily in this world. Now they're helping each other save their souls. 
and come to eternal life. So what was actually initially established by God as the means, marriage, of providing life in this world, now our Lord has given the power of a sacrament to also give life in the next by enabling a, a, sacrament, a, a sacrament of the living to increase the sanctifying grace in the soul for the life of glory and eternity. It's now life-giving on two levels, natural and supernatural. But why would the supernatural be placed after the natural? It is it is not placed after it so much in order of dignity, but you might say in order of development. <laughs> you know, in order of development because because God uh, actually initially instituted marriage as a natural institution, and only with the coming of our Lord were the sacraments instituted, and one of them was the sacrament of matrimony. So you, you might say, well, maybe, w w should we consider that to be an add-on that came along later? Uh, actually, no. Uh, the, the, the natural institution, the natural bond of a, a marriage between a man and a woman, um, was actually placed in, a, in another order, another order of existence, you might say, in being raised to the supernatural level. So even though we list them as the first and second and third goods of marriage, uh, the third being the supernatural good of matrimony, which is built upon marriage, that's why we can say every matrimony, every, every, every union of man and woman, even in, in sacramental matrimony, is marriage. We can call it marriage. But we can't say that every marriage is the sacrament of matrimony. Right. right? Um, that is what we have to keep in mind that when we talk about the third good of, matrim of, of marriage, matrimony, the sacrament, we're actually talking about something that is of a different order, a supernatural order. And it's not third in order of dignity or importance, but okay. contrary. Okay. All right. Well, Father, one last email, if we could here. This one uh, is... By the way, Tom, sure. if I may, <clears throat> can never, you know... <laughs> This helps explain why any union of man and woman, man and man, woman and woman, that is a sexual union that is not life-giving, that deliberately defeats the life-giving purpose, is a perversion and is evil. Right? And, um, you know, we talk about the same gender relationships here. But even within, even within a valid marriage, when a man and a woman are using birth control and they reduce their activity together to merely the level of each other's comfort and, and enjoyment, uh, they do that deliberately by a special act to preclude the conception of a child. They are perverting the whole God's primary essential purpose, and it is evil. And it doesn't make any sense. Well, I mean, it, 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 there's something also perverse, let's say, about a married, even a married couple, a man and a woman using artificial contraception and then denouncing homosexuality and saying it's wrong. Because what they're doing in their own relationship is something really very much against what is God's intent. It's the same principle. It's at work. the same principle, exactly. Mm -hmm. They're violating Father, what... Although the others are, are much more unnatural, you know, they bring in unnatural vice too, even sins that cry to heaven for vengeance, you know, and and uh, so anyway, I think it's very important for us to make very clear to people why homosexuality is wrong, why artificial birth control is wrong. Father, what is the difference between a relationship where uh, the couple intentionally uh, restricts the, the primary purpose by using artificial birth control. What is the difference between that and a union where the primary essential purpose is not possible? Let's say there's perhaps an older couple or, or, or someone who uh, is not capable, not physically capable of, uh, of of having that primary essential purpose of marriage. Would that still be a valid union, a valid? It certainly would because <clears throat> The beginning of children is the primary essential purpose, but there's another essential purpose. 
and that is stated by God also in Genesis, mm -hmm. the mutual support of the husband and the wife. That is also an essential purpose. Okay. It's just you can't subvert them by inverting them and making the mutual happiness of the couple and their enjoyment of each other primary over and above serving God by being open to giving life. Okay. You know, you have an older couple that cannot physically, naturally conceive a child. Mm. You look back in sacred scripture and you see there are some pretty interesting examples of those who were up in years, Abraham and Sarah, mm -hmm. right? Who conceived their son, uh, Isaac, right? right? Um, by an act, you know, God worked a miracle for them to conceive. And um, there are other examples too. For example, um, uh, Anna, right? Um, conceived Samuel, a son, when she was up in years. And um, her husband had basically given up on the idea that she was they were going to have a child together. But God gave them Samuel, the last great judge of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not unheard of. There are precedents. They're miraculous precedents. They are. But let's face it, if you have a couple in their 70s, or as we recently did, come down the aisle to get married, and... Um, we don't expect there to be a life-giving like, issue from them. But they're open to that. God will, if God wills it. But they can still fulfill the secondary essential purpose of being married. And that married, taking care of each other, helping each other sanctify their souls in marriage, and actually come to the life of heaven. In that sense, it still has that life-giving power okay. as a sacrament. You know? So... Um, Yes, there are marriages that, that don't produce any children. Um, that, you know, if it's done by God's will, then that, but still, they are fulfilling God's will, even not having children, but in being married and caring for each other. But um, if, it is, if God does want them to have a child and to bring children into the world, uh, that is, they are fulfilling the primary essential purpose of their union. Okay. Last email, Father, if we could get through this really quickly. We, we've had it for uh, for quite some time now, so I wanted to work through it if we could. What is the difference between gossiping and sharing grievances with a trustworthy person? Well, sharing grievances might be considered a matter of kind of unburdening oneself. One feels hurt, offended, whatever, and um, one wants to uh, talk to another person about it for the sake of getting sympathy. Perhaps, right? Um, is that a fault? It can be, right? If it's revealing the fault of others, the faults of others for the sake of, let's say, getting support for my cause, that I feel wronged by them, and I want others to know how I feel and how they wronged me, and I want others to have sympathy for me, and to reinforce my my sense of uh, being victimized by them. Uh, that can be wrong. You know? I mean, if someone goes to a, a, a wiser person, you know, it, go, it goes to them and says, look, I, I feel hurt by what this other person said or allegedly said, the rumor going around. And they're going to the other person and saying, well, how, should, am I right in feeling this way or am I wrong? You know, tell me and I'll accept what you say and take it seriously. And they're willing to to be corrected, say, no, you shouldn't feel that way. Or how do you even know they said that? You know, you're just going on the basis of rumor. They're willing to be corrected. That's that's not wrong. To go to somebody who you, you think will set you straight and help your thinking, you know, write your own thinking on this issue. That's different uh, than the case of someone who goes to another person for the sake of griping about how I'm uh, not treated properly, and I'm really upset about this, and I want an ally, right? I want an ally now in this against my adversary here. <clears throat> That's not right. Okay. It's about feeling sorry for oneself and wanting to draw others into that same, into that same mentality. I mean, gossiping though is more a matter of uh, not not the, the individual not feeling wrong necessarily, but just having some juicy tidbit on another person 
and they they want to spread some story that they think others will be interested in which is actually attacking the character of another person okay I mean, sharing grievances is where I'm personally offended by what somebody else said or did, or I think they said or did, but I think they said or what they, they meant to say, uh, whatever it is, you know, people get offended. But taking, taking some sense of them being offended to another person and trying to kind of justify it and draw them in, right, and get some encouragement um, um, that they're right in feeling this way. But gossip can be about just something totally foreign and unrelated to the person who's carrying the gossip. You know, their purpose is to entertain other people and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm sharing this with you because I know you'll be really interested in knowing that this is what happened, this is what they've done, I just heard this about so-and-so, some terrible um, event of the past, some crime that they did or whatever. And um, it's a very evil thing to do, to spread damaging stories about another person, damaging uh, about their character, uh, stories that will damage their reputation. They're like assassins, okay? They're basically like assassins. That's what, why they call it character assassination, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, uh, people have to get used to the idea that to spread negative stories about other people is sinful. You know, if, if the stories are true, that's a sin of detraction. If the stories are not true, it's a sin of calumny or slander, right? But is it ever permissible to speak ill of another in the sense of uh, to tell one person about the evil deed of another person? It is not only permissible at times, but even absolutely necessary at times, right? When would it be permissible to reveal the fault of another person that would not be gossip or slander or backbiting or anything of the kind? Well, when the person you're telling has a, has a need to, to know, um, to tell one's, uh, the parents of another person about what they're getting into, uh, because the parents need to know for the sake of those in their charge, those in their care, um, to tell um, perhaps the victim of a, of a swindle, right, that they are being swindled, that the people they're trusting cannot be trusted. Uh, so to protect the innocent, not only would it be uh, justified in saying something, it would be absolutely morally necessary. It would be a sin sinning not to say something to those people. Now, this is not comprehensive. There are all kinds of different circumstances that go into it. I'm just saying that there are uh, there are circumstances that would make it necessary to speak ill of another in telling the truth. Nothing could justify telling a lie, a damaging lie to another person or about another person. But there are circumstances in which you might necessarily tell the truth. But uh, if those circumstances are not realized, if one just wants sympathy or one just wants uh, attention, as in spreading gossip, uh, for its entertainment value, that would be sinful and could be mortally sinful. She actually asked, Father, when exactly is it a mortal, a mortal sin to speak negatively about other people? When you're doing serious damage to their reputation. Okay. When you're leading others to think very badly of them by the stories you're telling. And if there are horrible consequences, I mean, if you if you cause trouble in a marriage, if you are spreading lies, um, you know, involving, let's say, someone's integrity in business, destroy his livelihood, right? Um, if a politician is spreading lies knowingly, willingly, about an opponent for the sake of gaining the uh, the votes, uh, costing the other one votes. I mean, these, these are slanders. And there's a, a very, there's a very high price to pay for this. Okay. Father, who is... In this world and in the next one. Who is considered trustworthy enough to be the recipient of negative information about other people? 
Well, first of all, you know, there are people who have a right to know, a need to know. Parents need to know uh, what, you know, is for the welfare of their, of their offspring, their children, and, and each other, of their spouses, right? And uh, employers need to know the truth, right? But when there's a relationship there, uh, a relationship of responsibility, those responsible need to know. Um, what affects them in carrying out their responsibilities and protecting and caring for the other person. But in any case, um, if you were going, let's say, to seek advice, um, you wouldn't just go to anybody and say, okay, this is my problem. Who can tell me anything that might be helpful? You actually decide, okay, this is a good person. They're, they're thoughtful. They're wise. They're prudent. They're discreet. I can go and I can explain the situation to this person whom I know, and I know that they will keep it to themselves. I can trust them to be quiet about it. I can trust them to pray about it. I can trust them to then give me some very godly advice about it, okay, based upon um, faith and hope and charity and prudence, wisdom, justice, fortitude, and so on. And uh, I have reasonable hope that these people will be able to give me some good, solid uh, counsel and direction. And even if they can't, they will at least pray for this intention. So I know that no matter what else happens, there will be good that comes from this in seeking their advice. So, uh, yeah, you, I mean, I would hope that everyone would know someone like that, that they could go to for some wise counsel. Okay. It's a very lonely life for those who don't have anyone they can trust with that. Mm -hmm. uh, fine. Of course, there's no substitute for going directly to our Lord. That's a good point. And our Blessed Lady, you know, uh, for, that, for that direction in dealing with difficulties like this. Last question on this matter. Are we allowed to share problems with a trustworthy friend when the problem involves a priest or religious who is in the wrong and causing us suffering? Are we allowed to share that? Well, yeah, we're allowed to share it only in the sense that it will do good and not harm. I mean, if the motivation, first of all, if the motivation is, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, get an ally to support me in my grievances, well, that's that's selfishness, right? And uh, you're going already not to seek advice. You're just going to enlist support. Um, and that's not right, okay? So, um, but again, as I say, you know, to talk to a layman or to talk to a, um, a religious or to talk to another priest, when you're looking for some real advice and have the idea, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And uh, I mean, maybe the other person is wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. It's important for me to know if the other person is wrong. It's, it's even more important for me to know that I'm wrong. And I want to go to somebody who uh, will see clearly what the issues are and understand them, and who's willing to tell me not only when the other person is wrong, but is willing to tell me when I'm wrong also. I want, I need to, to know that. Uh, there was a case once... Um, when I was at a, a gathering uh, of some you know, Catholic laity, and I um, walked in upon a, a kind of friendly argument between two men. And they were arguing about, um, I, think, I think, some kind of film that they had seen uh, about some missionary activity of the church. And uh, there was a controversial scene when the, where, the, where a priest in the film took some action with the Blessed Sacrament, okay? And one was arguing that the priest should not have done what he did, and the other was arguing that the priest did what was right, even though the Blessed Sacrament wound up being profaned. I'm not going to go into um, the details here. And so I happened to show up just at the wrong moment. Oh boy. So they both turned to me and said, 
Father, settle an argument with us, okay? And so each presented his side, and uh, I said to them, well, as a matter of fact, you're both wrong. And so they looked at each other and they smiled and said, well, there's diplomacy for you. That's being a real <laughs> diplomat. And I said, no, no, no. If I were a diplomat, I would have told you you're both right. That's what a diplomat would do. Right? A diplomat is not somebody who gets you both angry because I'm telling you you're both wrong. That's the opposite of diplomacy. You know? But I, I, told, I just explained to them my point of view that what the, one, what the priest did was not what he should have done with the Blessed Sacrament. What the other was proposing was not what he would have done either. Right? Um, anyway, uh, so they they parted friends, and they probably figured we're never going to ask Father Jenkins anything. <laughs> um, but at least they, when they parted, they knew that I was willing to tell them where I thought they were wrong. That's good. So uh, again, I, I think we have to if if we're going to go to somebody and ask for advice, okay, and ask for counsel and direction. And if we're going with the attitude, they better not tell me that I'm wrong because I know I'm right, then we have no business going to them in the first place. It's not fair to the person we're going to, and it's not honest either. Um, so choose a good person, especially in marriage. When a husband and wife are going to talk to, let's say, a priest about a situation in the marriage, okay, uh, they, they want to go and talk to the priest um, who will not only tell their spouses that they're wrong, but who they have to be willing to hear from the priest where they're wrong too. Well, each one of them has to be willing to hear, well, okay, where am I wrong? Okay. And often, often the case is that you have uh, both sides wrong to some extent, where you have an action and over, uh, over action, over reaction, over reaction to the overreaction, and it escalates, right? So often the priest finds it necessary to tell the husband and the wife, sometimes individually, and I think you've, you know, you're, you are in the wrong in this, you're in the wrong in that. Um, but, you know, it's married life. That's uh, what it comes to. But you want to talk to somebody, as I say, who uh, will not be afraid to tell you not only where your adversary, you know, the adversarial marriage here, <clears throat> where the one side is wrong, but where uh, you might be wrong too. And that's much more important to you to know than where the other person is wrong, because you can correct what you're doing. Uh, so anyway, Tom, uh, all too often people are just looking for, uh, they're, they're looking to raise a, a, a mob of supporters. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why you generally don't go to relatives with your grievances in marriage. <laughs> Well, Father, I think uh, one thing for sure is that our viewers certainly do not mind talking to you because we have uh, well over 100 emails currently sitting in our inbox, but uh, we got through a couple of them tonight, so we're making progress. Okay, Tom, thank you. Yeah, thank well, you, Father. Thanks for being here. Uh, well, maybe they feel at ease sending those in because they think there's very little chance that <laughs> that will get to them, but I, we do tend to. We do. In fact, uh, I don't know if, I don't think our, our listeners know this yet, but you and I are getting together during the week occasionally to now to try to go through those emails and get yes, answers sir. to people. So it's not just what we do on the show. We're also trying to uh, answer people's concerns yep. even at other times as well. So thank yes, you very sir. much for the trust and sending the uh, sending the emails. We're working on it. Yep, definitely. Well, thanks, thanks for your patience. Thanks for being here tonight, Father. Appreciate Absolutely. your time. So, yep. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.